flats, got him on the gurney, got him to the hospital, and um, of course he died. But it was, you know, something that changed my life uh, in a big way because up until that time, it was like, okay, this is this, this is that, I'm just going to do my own thing, I'll stay this side. But all of a sudden, it was right there, close and personal, and... Um, you know, I had to make a lot of decisions, a lot of tough decisions, a lot of choices about the kind of person I wanted to be. When you talk about tough decisions, I mean, was that the turning point for you? I mean, you said this was the worst day of your life and the best day of your life. You know, I know the worst part because you were close to this dude. This dude was your partner. This is the guy you hung out with and passed your time with and you know, you had a lot of time, and sometimes when we got a lot of time, we're living in misery, but we find something, and we find someone, this is my buddy I'm going to hang out with. But you also said it was the best day of your life, and I want you to elaborate a little bit on that. Well, it shocked me into a new realization about myself and about my own life and the course of my life. I had to really begin to take a serious look at what was going on, what I had done uh, and what I was doing and what the future, it wasn't like looking back as much as it was looking forward. It was like, okay, what does the future hold here? What's, what, you know, is this, is this what the future is for me? Am I going to uh, end up you know, just being like Eddie or being like one of these gang members or um, am I going to be able to do something else with myself and my life? And, um, you know, it, it just, it kind of turned me around a little bit. I thought that, I thought that I could make something of my life. I thought that I could you know, change myself to the point where I was no longer, I, I don't think I was ever a real criminal because I don't know. I don't, I really don't, I don't know. I don't think people are, I think that label criminal is misused. I don't think it's a good label. Um, I'm catching the sun here off of this window. So we live in an RV now too but yeah it was just it was just confusing but i i wanted to do something different than i didn't want to be stuck uh in that situation in that penitentiary life i wanted to i wanted to do something different i wanted to change myself let me ask you this right because i know you said they hit you a little bit with the knife do you think they spared you simply because you were a white dude? I mean, did you get along with these dudes, you know, during yeah. the day before all of this shit happened? Like, hey, what's up, Jack? How are you, bro? Yeah. I knew them, and um, I wasn't close to any one of them, but I knew that we were on, you know, I presumed we were on really decent terms. I mean, I would have thought, you know, I would have thought that, they would have not decided to do something like that with him. I mean, there was 2,000 other people, 2,500 other people. Uh, you know, it was kind of almost like, what is going on here? Why, why, is, this, why is this thing happening like this? So, um, you know, it was a little bit of a, a mystery to me. Uh, and I guess, in a way, I felt I guess I felt mad, but I felt I don't know how to describe it. I just felt like um, like this was such a needless killing such a ignorant 
act. I, I just couldn't process how any intelligent human being would come to the decision to engage in those behaviors under those circumstances. I just didn't make sense. You know, the Aryan, the Aryan Brotherhood was known for murder and extortion. And, you know, this is what these guys were living this life in their mind where this is what prison's going to be like and we're going to be the baddest dudes around. And I think they're, you know, the, a couple of the dudes ended up with life over that. I looked them up before and I think they all had life. Um, for killing that dude. And I don't think they started out with life, but they ended up with life sentences. Um, one of them continues to appeal his case. I looked that up, you know, and, and you know what? He's all done. I think he's in USP Pollock, just had two murders there that we talked about the other day. But, you know, these dudes were some, you know, they're known for being vicious dudes. Were they the strongest gang in Atlanta as far as the white gangs go at that time? There was a number of gangs operating inside Atlanta at that time. In Atlanta, had, there were no security cameras anywhere, and it was wide open. I mean, wide open, uh, as, as wide as it could be. Uh, you know, you're in the center of Atlanta, and you know a lot of the officers were driving Corvettes and BMWs and Porsches, and you know, I mean, it's, it's just it's obvious that. There was a lot of things going on. So, um, you know, right after that event, they uh, did uh, murder a correctional officer right on the same uh, tier, on the same block, um, about a couple of months after, uh, you know, the Walton murder. Um, that was an African-American officer, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was over a drug um, deal gone bad or what have you. Um, as far as I understand, I don't know that much about it. But it, it just shows how dangerous the place was, how wide open it was, and how violent people were. There were the, the guards there, when they did the counts, like the evening count, like 9 o'clock or whatever it was, they would just close the doors on the end of the ranges and look in. They'd stand at the end of the range and look in. And they'd be like, yeah, it looks like they're all there. And then they'd go to the next room. <laughs> you think the cops were scared back then? Yeah. Yeah. So you were in a house of horrors. I mean, Atlanta was one of the most dangerous prisons back then, if not the most dangerous. You're living there. Your best friend dies in your arms. What does that do to you mentally, if you can remember? what Do you lay in your bunk that night like, wow. I mean, what are you thinking after your friend dies? Had you ever seen anyone die before like that? No, they, you know, that was what the, it was a, it was a big shot. It was, um, you know, because that was covered with his blood. He just bled out all over me. So I had blood out in my hair, all over me uh, from the top down. And I remember standing in the shower. You know, they took me to the shoot immediately, of course. Um, you know, you're going to the shoot. And the other guy, one of the other guys that was just standing around down on the flats, um, he kind of helped a little bit carry the gurney, uh, but they locked him up too. Um, you know, because obviously if you intervene and try to help, then um, you know, there's a problem with that or could be. So um, I remember just showering and seeing all that blood just. It was like a scene from Carrie where she's in the shower, just showering off all that pig's blood that, that fell on her. That's what it reminded me of because it was just just red blood and a lot of it just coming off of me. And it was his blood. It was, it was just surreal. It was, it was a horror show. It was a horror show. I can only imagine. And then you end up getting transferred from Atlanta. Is that when you end up going to Fort Dix? Yes. I want to talk a little bit about Fort Dix. You were gonna, you end up escaping. I know we've we've had this conversation before. But what drove you to escape? When you're in, in Fort Dix, you're like, man, I'm done. I've seen some shit I didn't want to see. I don't want to be involved in this no more. I mean, what is it that made you, you know, escape, climb the well, fence? I wanted to go see my son. My son was 13 years old at the time. Going on 14, and I hadn't seen him in a number of years, and he was going through 
some problems. And, uh, you know, skipping school and starting to uh, smoke pot and a lot of, you know, marijuana use and other drugs. And he was just, I could see that he was going off on the wrong track. But I just wanted to, I just wanted to be with him. I just wanted to see him. Um, I wanted to spend some time and I thought, well, you know, I'll go and I'll get him and we'll be able to, maybe we can go, you know, somewhere and just spend a few months or whatever. And, you know, I'll go back and finish my time afterwards or whatever, because I had such a long sentence. And they certainly weren't going to let me go on our furlough, so I took my own furlough. Let me ask you this, right? You were, you escaped. How long were you gone for, John? Three days. And tell the people how you get caught. What are you doing when they catch you? Well, I mean, people that escape, they typically go back to the places they know. And, you know, U.S. Marshals, federal agents, they know this. So, um, but in my case, um, they were, they, they weren't really like staking anyone out or, or doing anything like that at first, but somebody in the family, um, you know, called the police and let them know that I was in the area. So that's how they got on to me. And then there was a big manhunt and a big chase. And then I was captured at the Carousel Mall in Syracuse. I thought I read, was it you that was maybe out mowing grass for somebody or something? Yeah. You were, yeah. <laughs> tell yeah. us about that. You, you helped some old lady mow her grass or something, didn't you? Yeah, I pulled up to my, uh, my half-sister's house. and You might have to pull that phone down a little bit because I can only see like, oh, there we go. Yeah, I was trying to see my half-sister, so... Um, her name is Tamara. So I pulled up to their house and, uh, you know, I was sitting there in the car and this really old lady came out in the front yard and their lawn was really out of control. It had grown wild for a while. And she had this old push mower and she was trying to start it. And she was about probably 75 years old or something. And, you know, she could. So I just got out of the car. I said, yeah. All right, I'll go help her while I'm waiting. So I went up there and I said, you mind if I help you get this mower started? And she said, oh, no, no, if you can get it started, I'd really appreciate it. So um, I got it started and then I just told her, well, why don't I go ahead and just mow the yard for you and you just, you know, take a rest and I'll get it done for you. And she's like, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. So I just went ahead and mowed the front yard, and then uh, when I got the front yard mowed, um, you know, she came out and she had some cold sodas, and she said, uh, you know, well, you know, my side yard and, and the backyard could used to be mowed too, <laughs> so <laughs> I went ahead and mowed those and stuff, but I had fun doing it, I, I enjoyed it, you know? Not exactly the um, hardened criminal you know, a man that has compassion and, and you got 40 something years and you're out on an escape and you're mowing people's grass. And that's, you know, that might have been one of the last memories that you had, huh? Yeah, that was a good one. It was a good one. You ever lay in your bunk in the ADX and think about that one time when you were mowing that old lady's grass? Yeah, that was, I mean, it was, it was May. It was a beautiful day, sunshine. Um, and, you know, I hadn't walked on grass in years, in years. I mean, it was, you know, it was, it was just, it was beautiful just to smell the fresh cut grass, to feel the breeze, to feel the sun on my back, and, um, just to be doing something for someone. Um, and it all fit together for a perfect couple of hours. I'd have to say that was a highlight of my escape. You know, I want to say this, right? Because 
you know, sometimes people leave comments. Well, if you do the crime, you, you know, you got to do the time and don't cry now. And, and we see those types of comments. But, you know, I understand that, you know, you committed some crimes and you deserve to go to prison. I deserve to go to prison. But we didn't deserve the time that we got. And that's what people need to understand. You know, right. people can be rehabilitated. People can change their lives. And I'm going to tell you <clears throat> right now that you are in a different place than the place that you were in when we, when the two of us met. Your voice is a bit different. You got more pep in your step. Um, I always knew that you were an extremely intelligent person um, just from the conversations that we had. I know that you've wrote numerous books. While I was there, you had drafted the manual. I know your books are on Amazon, I believe. And, you know, I want my viewers to go check them out. Support John. Check out a book. You know, buy one of his books. Support him. Um, extremely intelligent dude. And we'll, we'll put the links and stuff in there. But I want to ask you a couple more questions, John. You get out of prison after 33 years. And I seen, you know, they got that little documentary over there um, from the New York Times. What's it called? First Tuesday or Tuesday something? After, Tuesday afternoon. It's called Tuesday afternoon. And I watched that last night. You know, when we talk, we talk last night. It's late. You send me the link. Me and my wife, we watch it. And I'm just going to be straight up, bro. You know, you've seen your mom and your mom says, your mom's like, I didn't know if I was going to make it to see you get out of prison, right? And, you know, I dealt with that stuff in, in prison myself where, I, you know, my mom's in bad shape. I'm like, I don't know if I'm ever going to see my mom. And when I watched that part of that documentary, man, it did make me cry, bro. It brought tears to my eyes, man. And I had a rough night last night, right, after watching that. Because it brings up memories. It makes you think about how grateful you really are to have your freedom, to be able to walk out of prison. What was it yeah. like, in all honesty, for John Powers to walk out of that gate and the gate closes and you know it's over, man? This is your reality. You're free, man. You're finally free, John. What was that like in that moment? Well, it was, it was, it was great. It was, it was awesome. But there's, you know, there's this last chain that they keep around your neck with this supervised release thing. So you're not really free, free because, you know, all those conditions and that, I mean, I know that I'm not breaking any of them or anything like that, but it's still, you know, this sword kind of hanging over your, your, your neck. Um, but other than that, it's just, it, it's, you know, it's, I want it to be like glorious. I want it to be really great, but the experiences that I've had kind of take some of that away um, because, you know, I have been damaged and there's uh, you know probably uh, pretty severe PTSD there's uh, you know there's a lot of things that kind of I mean you know I really I'm 60 years old 61 years old now so um, you know the vast majority of my life has been spent in a cage so coming out into society, having a record, having to, you know, I went on job interviews and people, as soon as they found out, and I would tell them right out, I'd say, look, you know, I just got out of prison. I did almost 33 years. And I could see them kind of look at their shoes or look at the floor or look at the ceiling or, and, you know, it's kind of the same old thing. Um, do you want the guy that's just served 33 years in federal penitentiary and is 60 years old, or do you want the young kid who has no criminal record or give 25, 24, or whatever? Uh, it's it's a no-brainer. I can't really, uh, you know, blame people for making those decisions, but it still has an effect on me because it's like, you know, I want to feel good about myself. I want to feel good about my life. And I do, for the most part. But there's still baggage. There's still residual thoughts and feelings that come along 
that whole experience. I can't just not be who I am uh, or, you know, what I've experienced. It's, it all goes into the same equation, right? 100%. You know, I should have asked you this too before we talked about that. So let's, let me reverse just a bit. You leave the ADX and you end up coming to Tucson. When you come to Tucson, you're in the school building. One of the staff members tell you, get on the wall. They pat, they start to pat you down. And you hit this guy, right? What happened with this? Huh? Let me tell you the backstory a little bit about what happened. I went down there to make a copy of the manual program for another guy who wanted it. So when I was standing in the hallway at the education department, um, the dude was, the education employee was beefing with these two other guys. And I mean, he was, he was being a bit belligerent and rude, I thought, to them. He was, you know, he went way overboard beyond, he was just dogging them out. That's what he was doing. And so, you know, he, after he was done dogging them out, I'm standing there a few feet away. He comes over to me and he says, what do you want? And he's still, you know, in an aggressive mode. I said, well, I'm trying to get a copy of the manual here made and I'm trying to get a binder for it. You know, one of those little plastic binders. So he said, let me see that. And he just kind of yanked it out of my hands and he flipped through it real quick. He said, this isn't legal material. You're not going to copy this here. And no, you can't have a binder for it. So I said, well, okay. So he went to his office and a couple minutes later, and I just stood there and I was like, I was thinking about the whole thing. I was, cause I couldn't move. It was between moves. I was kind of stuck right there. So I was just thinking, well, you know, what's up with this dude anyway? So he comes blasting back out of his office a few minutes later and he just goes rushing by me. He's like, you still here? I'm like, yeah, I have to wait for the move. He's like, well, don't make sure you don't miss it or something like that. So it just triggered me. And I turned and I said, you know, what is your name anyway? And he said, you want my name? You want my name? My name is right there on the bulletin board. So I looked at the bulletin board and I said, okay, there's a bunch of names up here. Which one of these is yours? And he said, that doesn't matter. And he said, don't, don't be messing with me or you're going to go to lieutenant's office. And when he said that, it triggered me again. So I followed him down that little hallway. And I said, what did you say to me? And I said, you're not going to talk to me the way you just talked to those two other guys. I hope you know that right now. Um, and so he got on the radio and called for reinforcements. So when they got there, they all surrounded me and took me down the hallway. It wasn't a move. It was just an empty hall. When we got down by the metal detector, um, he wanted to shake me down. And uh, he wanted me to hand him the, the manual. And I wouldn't give it to him. So he yanked it out of my hand. And it went, you know, the pages just went all over the floor. And before I knew it, I just saw my fist you know, an overhand right, rock it out, boom. <laughs> and he went down to his knees, and then the dude behind me hit me in the back of the head with his radio, and then the other four or five guys jumped off me and tried to tackle me down. We went way down by the psychology office before they got me down, and then, you know, a bunch of other people came and jumped up the pile. You know, you know, that's the other part I want people to know about federal prison, because the guy that you had an issue with, he was always an asshole worked in education. Um, I don't remember if he was the supervisor, but I remember him being an asshole because I did a lot of law work and stuff like that. But these people go out of their way just to be nasty to people. This guy didn't know that you just served, you know, 20 years in solitary confinement. He was just being who he is every day, mistreating people. You talk to people. Just because you commit a crime don't mean you treat me like a dog. You treat me right. like we're in some third world country. Men respect men. Talk to me the same way I talk to you. Treat me the way that I treat you. You're supposed to be a professional. You work in, for the federal government. You're a federal employee. 
You couldn't get a job in the private sector the way that you act with some of these people. Just plain out nasty, you know? But yeah. you, you, And that's how we ended up beating. You end up coming to the hole. I'm already in the hole. I'm down there for, you know, that big, you know, the, the, the K2 investigation, um, which was, you know, whatever. That was when I wasn't always a nice guy. But, you know, I ended up turning my life around, changed my life. You know, we, we, we separated. You, you went where you had to go, and I stayed there for another six months in the hole or whatever. But now, John, you're out of prison. Do you appreciate your freedom? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I live here with my wife, and uh, we have a little puppy. And, um, you know, I do what I can for work around. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, I just, I like to be able to go where I want to go and do what I want to do and breathe. You know, there's something different about free air. Um, when you're breathing confined air, uh, you know, it's just something different in the air. There's a different feeling, I think. I don't think human beings were meant to be put in cages by other human beings. I just, I find it just unnatural. Um, you know, if somebody has done something bad enough where a civilized society feels you know, they can't be a part of it anymore, then look, just put a bullet through my brain and be done with it. Is the way I feel about it is, you know, if I've, if I've done something that grossly terrible that society says honestly and fairly, hey, we just, you know, we just can't have you around anymore in society. Don't put me in a cage and keep me in a cage for the rest of my life. What kind of bullshit is that? I mean, go ahead and put a, you know, go ahead and execute me. I mean, get me off the face of the earth then. Um, but again, that's just the way I think or feel about it because I don't think human beings were made to be in cages. But I want to say one thing just to correct the record a little bit. About, I, I forget to tell this name um, that I assaulted in uh, in the penitentiary down there in Arizona. Um, but later on, he did actually take some degree of responsibility for what had happened. <clears throat> and I mean, that was, I know that everybody. Uh, knew him as an asshole and, and but for some reason that kind of changed him a little bit in some way. I mean, I don't, I don't know how, but he actually, uh, when they did my PSI, he actually wanted to come to the sentencing, not to point the finger, but to ask the judge for leniency. And they, they were quite lenient. They only give me a year, in a day, so um. I was worried about you because I said, "Wow, man, they're going to charge this dude, and they're going to they're going to smoke him, man." I thought they were going to. They could have given me an ass load of time behind that too. You know that that's a yeah. 20, 20 year offense. I thought maybe they would career you or something, and and just yeah. you know just finish you off, but. And I also know that you have a lot of people behind you, man. A lot of big lawyers behind you with the whole, you know, ADX project, stuff like that. But now you're living your best life. And I think people can tell from this interview how intelligent you really are because you're an extremely intelligent. One of the, one of the most intelligent people I've ever met in my life. And I mean that sincerely. Um, Thank you. I feel the same about you, though. I feel the same about you. I do. Well, I, well, I appreciate that. It, it, that means a lot, man. Um, But I know that... You know, the things that you've been through, most people couldn't handle. The things that you've been through, some people can't even imagine. I mean, I've been through some tough shit, but I haven't been through the things that you've been. I haven't been locked in a cell for years upon years. I haven't been put in a cage for years upon years. I mean, when we were together, I spent 14 months in the hole back then. That was the longest stretch that I had did. It affected me. Um, I, I don't know if you remember. I used to think that, you know, th that they were going to put the dogs in there on me. I started thinking crazy shit. I stopped eating the food. I thought they were spitting in my food. You know, I went through some shit down there. I wasn't eating. But, you know, nothing near what you went through. You can give, you know, you got all these prison consultants, and I own a prison consultant business, but you can give people 
a real insight when it comes to that stuff. And, you know, I really want you to give a message to people that are heading down the wrong path because you are intelligent. What would you tell a young man that's on the wrong path? I know you, you hit on some of this earlier, but that's what I want to know, John. What would John Powers, John Jack Powers, tell some young man that's on the wrong road? Or a guy that just got out of prison that feels like, you know what, life's too hard. I can't make it. What would you tell him? Well, I would just tell anyone that is involved or thinking about engaging in any kind of criminal activity to rethink that whole thing because you're exposing yourself to a very real potential of, of having to find yourself in a cage. In a, in a concrete and steel cage like an animal um, just penned up for not just for a couple hours or a few days or a few months, but for years and years on end, perhaps. So, but the thing is that you can't really, you can't convince somebody that's already in the lifestyle. Like I think, I, I try to think about what someone could have said to me when I was out there, Robin Banks, what could somebody, because there was a lot of people that tried to intervene in my life at that time, as I'm sure, you know, there were people around you from time to time that probably tried to intervene one way or another. Yeah. But do we listen to them? Do we take it to heart? Do we, do we say to ourselves at that point in time, yeah, you know what? That dude knows what he's talking about. He's right. And um, I'm going to find a different way to go. I'm going to do this right. I'm going to just take small steps. And I'm just going to stay within the boundaries of the law. And I'm going to live uh, as good a life and be as decent of a human being as I can be. No, that's not the way people think. They think, yeah. Fuck that. I can get away with this. I'm, not, I'm doing this. I'm doing me. You know, this guy, they just got caught and, you know, they're feeling bad because he got caught and he had to do all that time. Fuck them. I mean, that's kind of almost the attitude with, you know, it's hard to get through to the, the youngsters. It's hard to get through to people that are just, they're on that path. They're going there. You know what, though? You know what I think, though, John? We live in a different time now since we've gotten out. There's videos of people being stabbed. You know, I got a video on when the, that murder happened at Pollock, um, when Eddie Branch. I got a video up like that. You know, they see the effects of incarceration. They see what it's done to you. And, you know, and someone that's watching this video, this is probably one of the best prison genre video you could ever have. A guy that spent 33 years in prison, a guy that spent, you know, 22 years in solitary confinement. You know, the ADX like the back of your hand because that was your home for so many years. You know, you bit your, your fucking fingers off, bro. So this is the reality of what prison does to you. And I've read the articles. They said you were perfectly normal when you went in and it mentally fucking destroyed you, man, to break you down to that point. And that's what I want people to see. And maybe we might not save a lot of people, but I think that we can save some. I think that we yeah. can, because you know what prison yeah. did? It saved me. It made me appreciate my freedom. I'm never going back to prison, bro. Yeah. And I think about it every day, like, no, never. I'm never yeah. going back. And, you know, I think that's what the message is today. And the message is also, because I know we're going to run out of time here shortly, but the message earlier, you said something about hope. When you take people and you take away hope, that's the message. When they take you and they take your life and they say, you're going to prison, you're 21 years old, and we're giving you life because you were a drug dealer. You didn't have any violence, but they take away all hope. And then what happens? Then they go to prison and they feel like, I might as well kill. I might as well rob. I might as well steal because they can't take anything else. Everything that mattered is gone. And that's what it's about. The federal government, if you're out here selling dope, if you're out here robbing people, they're going to take everything you got, man. They're going to take your life and they're going to crush it. And, you know, I am, you know, and, and it's all right to say this shit because I used to never be like that. You know me, John. I was a tough guy, man, in prison. I was, fuck that. I'm, I'm hardcore. I'm whatever. I don't give up about these people. And you know what? I thought I'd never have PTSD and I walked out of prison. And sometimes I come in my office and I just cry, bro. Or sometimes I go out in the backyard and I scream. Or when I read your articles, it, 
Your articles in the Troy Kell video are, are two things that broke me down when I got out. And I was like, wow, man, am I okay out here? Will I make it? And you know what? I've been out 27 months, and I'm going to keep pushing forward, and I'm going to keep trying to make it. And I want you're you to keep it. making it. You're going to make it. We're it, both going to make it, brother. There ain't <laughs> no doubt about it. We have to, man. I love you like a brother, man. And, you know, I had talked about you before and a few times. And, you know, I talked about the wall ball, and that's because you always stuck in my mind, man. And I always, I always worried about you. And I was like, man, is he going to make it? And when I seen you got out, you made it. And I'm like, man, is he going to make it out here? And I'm glad to see you're married. I'm glad to see you're working. I'm glad to see, you know, you're working with the New York Times and they're doing this documentary on you. And they should, because you should be the example of why we shouldn't do the things that we do in this, in the land of the free, you know, home of the brave, where we take people and we put them in cages. And, you know, we want people to think that we have these humane prison conditions, but really we don't. We got cops in there that are, couldn't work in the private sector. They're beating the shit out of people, you know, ruining your cell, taking any little thing that you got to pass your time, such as a basketball rim, or they'll take your book and rip pages out of it just to be plain nasty. So, before we close, man, I want to tell you, man, that I definitely appreciate you. When this ends, I'd like to get back on here with you for, you know, five, ten minutes before you go to bed or I go to bed because I've been up since five in the morning. But, you know, I do appreciate you coming on. I do appreciate you sharing your experiences. And I know that my viewers have been waiting for this. I didn't think this would ever happen. But, you know, we found each other. Your wife found me and you seen me on YouTube. Your wife wrote me. I said, hell yeah, I called you right away as soon as I seen that message. And, you know, and, th and this materialized. And I appreciate you, man. Great. You're doing a great thing, really. I mean, you're a great human being. You're 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 a good man, and you're doing a really good thing with this program and with everything that you're doing. Um, it brings me a lot of joy. I mean, just I can't even begin to express how much joy um, it brings me to see you now um, and and do it as good as you're doing. But yeah, just. Just keep doing good. You're doing good. And I'm going to keep doing good. And we'll just keep in contact. And maybe we do some more segments and talk about specific. Um, you know, I might have to. Or, I might have. I might have to show up in Northern California, man, and we'll do one live. You never yeah. know. You never yeah. know. I might show up. I want yeah. to see you in person, bro. You know what I mean? Outside of, you know, a wreck cage and or in the special housing unit, yeah. bro. Absolutely. Absolutely. So John, I'm going to, you, you love too, you, bro. Man. I love you too, bro. I'm going to, I'm going to close the show, man. And All tell, right. and then I'm going to call you right back. I'll send you a zoom link, but I want everyone to know, man, we appreciate you tuning in, share this video, blood on the razor wire with respect until tomorrow. We're out.